It's official. It's official. We have a DA and ANC coalition. Let's be very honest from the get-go. This is not a government of national unity. Not in the true sense of the meaning of a government of national unity. This is just a branding exercise to call it a government of national unity. In effect, what we have here is what I like to think of as the RAND coalition or the continuity coalition. It's a government of national continuity, continuity of status quo in all of the places where people have been looking for change. Right. Why am I saying it's not a government of national unity? If you look at previous examples of govern governments of national unity, they were inclusive of parties which had grave disagreements. And in order to create peace and stability in those particular countries, those grave disagreement parties were brought together. Look at 1994, when it was the IFP, the ANC, and the National Party. It's very clear there that there were grave differences. We know what the conflict was between the ANC and the IFP, and we know what the conflict was between the ANC and the National Party. Bringing those adversarial groups together at that time was a real government of national unity. In Zimbabwe, when a government of national unity was formed in 2008 as well, there was a bringing together of two very, very um, adversarial political parties, the Movement for Democratic Change and the ZANU-PF. The same applies to the example of Kenya. And also, if you look at a government of national unity, which was formed in Zimbabwe in the 80s between ZANU-PF and ZAPU, those two entities had been on different sides of a genocide, right? In the early 80s, there was a Gukurahundi massacre committed in Zimbabwe by the ZANU-PF and orchestrated by high-level officials of the ZANU-PF. And when that came to an end, a government of national unity was formed. What would have been a real government of national unity in South Africa? It would have included the MK party, the EFF. These are parties that have grave disagreements between themselves and the DA, themselves and the ANC. If those had been brought together, that would have been truly a government of national unity. But this really is not that. This is a RAND coalition. And guess what? The temperature of the RAND is very warm. The RAND is happy today. It's at the beach. It's chilling. And you can see that from the graph. It actually strengthened a little bit today. So the RAND is happy with this coalition because this is the coalition that they wanted. There is a question that needs to be asked around the influence of the markets, the media, and particular billionaire families in orchestrating this outcome. Because some families funded political parties specifically, some media houses or some businesses that own media houses such as NESPAS funded particular political parties. And then they also report on those particular parties and give a preference for which coalition they think is better. That's something that we have to think about. Is that undue influence or is it just fair influence in, in the democracy? One of the things that I think we all need to think about is whether or not the promises that were made in the build-up to this coalition becoming a reality were actually going to be delivered. We were told that the RAND will, will strengthen to 1 is to 1750. So we're going to have to wait and see if the markets are going to deliver their side of the bargain because this is what we were seeing being reported in the media, that the RAND could get so strong and the RAND won't fall, etc., etc., because the markets are going to pick up the RAND. You know, The markets were saying that they're the ones who are going to pick up the RAND, but if you don't watch out, the RAND will fall. So... Why am I saying this is a DA coalition, a DA ANC coalition? There's something that is very critical to recognize. This is just a DA plus one coalition. You know, they brought plus one and a plus one, which was funded by the Oppenheimers, the same funders of the Democratic Alliance. Why am I saying that um, this is a, a, a um, ANC DA coalition plus one? There's something in this coalition agreement which stipulates the following. The GNU shall take decisions in ac accordance with the established practice of consensus. Where no consensus is possible, the principle of su sufficient consensus shall apply. Sufficient consensus exists when all the parties have had the opportunity to express their views, despite reasonable attempts to resolve disagreements and find common ground. There is no general consensus. 
parties to the GNU representing 60% of seats in the National Assembly agree and any party that disagrees has been able to formally record their objections. I want to go back to that clause 19.3. It says, when there's a disagreement, the only way that you move forward is if parties to the GNU representing 60% of the seats in the National Assembly. Which parties in the GNU have got 60% of the seats in the National Assembly? ANC has got 40, DA has 21. So it's the two of them. Even if the IFP disagrees for the next five years, their disagreement will mean nothing to this coalition. Therefore, it's not, an, it's not a GNU in a real sense. It's an ANC and DA coalition. That's what it is. And we have to be honest about that. Whatever, whatever jargon is being used to describe this, the reality is it's an ANC and DA coalition. And by the way, I did speak about this weeks ago and say this was a prospect and that there was footage from 2019 of Helen Zilla saying this is exactly what they wanted to do, just showing why Action SA was taken for such a ride. So let's talk about Wazulu Natal for a, for a, for a moment. IFP is going to have the premier in Wazulu Natal right that's what's going to happen and also the speaker is going to be anc this is something that i think will create frustration disappointment and almost uh, questioning of the outcomes by the mk and its supporters the reality is the umkonto wesizo party had a plurality of support, a strong plurality of support with 45%. For the government to then come out and be a premier of a, of a party that had 18% and to have a speaker from a party that had 17%, I think that is going to seem to the people of Wazulu Natal like their democratic will and expression was not respected. Obviously, technically, this is, this is correct, right? You can form a coalition, you can squeeze out a person who had 45% if you can get the 55%. But individually, do you actually have a strong mandate? And can you go back to those people and say that you have the legitimacy and authority to govern them when they, in a strong plurality, gave that support to the MK party? Please don't misconstrue what I'm saying as saying that I endorse the anti-constitutionalism of the MK party or that I endorse some of their election denialism that they've been really been relying on. I'm actually speaking about the sentiment as expressed by the voters in the ballot, which was to say, MK, we are giving you 45% of the vote share. That seems to me to be a mandate to the MK to lead that province. The same way that we have acceptance and grace in understanding that the ANC, with the largest vote share nationally, should form the national government. I believe that we should have the same understanding and moral position to say that the MK party should administer the Wazulu Natal province. In moving away from this, I think that the seeds of discontent are being sowed. And this is going to be something that is undigestible and unpalatable to a large number of people in Wazulu Natal. And we may see the consequences very soon in that when the 2026 elections, which are about 26 to 28 months away, come around, we may see that the IFP will take a, a hiding in the local government elections because people will say, we didn't vote for you, we didn't choose this. And right now, I think that is where the direction is going. I want to then have a discussion around what this may mean in the political sense, political science sense. I think that this particular coalition indicates a shift to the right by the ANC. Typically, the ANC has been very strong on leftist principles because of its um, tri tripartite alliance, because of its ideological underpinnings. But that, that is something that I think it's going to move away from right now. This particular administration seems to be an adherent to neoliberal principles, neoliberal principles which really rely on the private sector and believe in the privatization model of the state. So they are actually creating a smaller government 
and moving towards privatization of water, of electricity, of the ports. Uh, we've seen a conversation around further privatization of um, Transnet. This is a neoliberal consensus ANC. And this is not typically the nature of the politics of the ANC, although there's a fair argument to be made that the Tabombegi administration was also a neoliberal leaning ANC. Right. So long term, long term, the privatization of public goods does create more inequality and it does increase the cost of living. We've seen this in the United Kingdom. We've seen this in America. We've seen this in Australia. If you want to look at an interesting case study, look at what happened with Thames Water in London. They privatized water in the 90s and now they have sewage quality water and the water quality has gone down and there's discussion around a need to nationalize water in the United Kingdom because of the failures of the private sector. The private sector is not God. The private sector is not perfect. And Usually, the check and balance that exists in the private sector is that when you have competition, customers can choose whether to buy product A, product B, product C. So if KFC has got funny chicken, you go to Pedro's, you go to another place, you go to another place. But that doesn't happen in natural monopolies. Natural monopolies are industries where because of the costs of uh, operating in that business. Only a few players can really have enough resources to operate there, which is what happens with electricity, with water, with uh, infrastructure such as fiber internet, right? So in natural monopolies, that competition element doesn't exist. And what happens over time, especially where there's a weak government or where there's a government that can be easily bribed, is that those companies basically do whatever they want. And they don't have an incentive to improve, to innovate, and to actually deliver quality services to customers. And this is likely what is going to happen in this particular situation. Right. Moving to um, thinking about 2026. Will these particular decisions that have been made today affect 2026? I think they may. They may hurt or help parties. You know, the coalition between the ANC and the DA is a coalition of the wounded. The DA has lost 600,000 votes since 2014, right? They, they are relatively proud of this 3.4 million number. But the reality is that they were on 4.1 million in 2014. So they are not growing as a political party. They are struggling to maintain just that position. And they may be very well comfortable to do that because, as we heard in that voice note, Helen Zilla thinks that you can do a lot with 20%. Obviously, you can. They're getting five cabinet positions, senior cabinet positions in this administration. That's one of the terms of the deal that's being reported. But if this coalition of the wounded continues to be in gridlock, if they have you know, differences of opinion where they cannot get to that 60% mark, to actually, um, where they cannot get the two parties to agree within cabinet. It means very little legislation will be introduced or proposed, and it means very little will happen in the sense of amendments to regulation that may be necessary as the conditions in the country change. What that could mean is that with a strong opposition that can complain from the branches freely, because now the DA is not opposition, they can record their disagreement as they want to, but they're going to be part of this administration and they're going to be held to some of its failures and some of its successes. If there are no successes, if there is continued gridlock, it's very likely that in provinces such as Wazulu Natal, provinces such as Mpumalanga, we may see a growth of um, the left, that being MK and also being the EFF. And there may be many members of the ANC in the base who are actually unhappy with this marriage with the DA. Those members may be members of the uh, unions. Those members may be people who are socialists. Those members may be people who don't view having a white-led political party as uh, appropriate for a coalition partner, considering some of the rhetoric that has come from Helen Ziller and John Stainazen. Remember what John Stainazen said about the vigilantes in Phoenix. Remember what Helen Ziller said about... Um, colonialism, where she said it wasn't all that bad and it had positive legacies. Those things may really bother the base of the ANC. You may think that the base doesn't matter, but I want to bring a case study and an example to you that I think is worth considering. And that case study and example is Rishi Sunak and uh, the Tory party in the UK. 
Rishi Sunak was never elected by the base. And in fact, when he contested, he lost. The base of the party did not find him to be a good, credible leader for them, the Tory party. He then got in through a technicality and negotiated deal in parliament. The parliamentary caucus voted for him. But now it's an election season. The um, United Kingdom is going to an election on the 4th of July, right? And now what they are seeing is that the Tory party is facing its worst defeat in decades. They are going to lose more seats than they've ever lost before. And there's nothing that he can do to stop it, right? And that's because they made a decision at an executive level that did not have support at a base level. So I'm wondering if this is not a replication of that. If we're not going to have a situation where people think that in 2026, sorry, in 2024, we stopped, uh, you know, crisis, but in fact, they only delayed their own eventual demise. This is a very high risk game for both the ANC and the DA to play because their base supporters may not appreciate this. What do you think, though? Let's have a conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. 89% of you haven't subscribed to the channel, so please leave a subscribe. It helps YouTube know you enjoy the content and it helps others to find this particular channel. Till the next one.